screen saver as in the screen mm -hmm. we are live now good and we recording yeah. let's see how many people so that's fast Okay, I see Babita. Hi, Babita. That's my wife there. Yeah, Shripad is there. From most people that I know, yeah. Amit Bhatia. If it's the same Amit Bhatia that I know, then why? We have sixteen already, and this is the first time that we've started early. We usually start bang at seven. Tilga is there. Hi. Anupata, I must say, you are, you are drawing a lot of viewers today. There are many first time viewers too. <laughs> Milan, she sent a note. Welcome. So, long journey, Alok, after almost starting this initiative in the middle of the pandemic and then. Uh, initiative is going on. So is the pandemic. No, no signs of uh, pandemic going away. Yeah. <laughs> we kept on talking of post-pandemic world. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope it is post-pandemic now, Sangram, because uh, uh, my mom and dad, they got their vaccination. They are uh, super senior citizens. They got their vaccination uh, done two days ago. So at least we are see seeing some you know, reprieve, they're seeing some, it's coming seemingly to an end. Uh, but the world has changed. And I think we started with the premise that the world has changed. It is not going to go back to where we started from. And I think a lot of things about the way people will go to their work, they will approach their work, the way people- Will they go to work? Oh, yeah, <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I don't intend to. I'm quite happy with this. <laughs> Same here. Same Very here. cozy work from home. And trust me, I mean, we initially were struggling and I uh, even thought of, uh, you know, saying that, okay, when it ends, we'll start going to work. And I rationalized it saying that the magic of face-to-face -face is not there on Zoom. And then I, I think two months back, I started going to WeWork on a trial basis and uh, taking day passes and uh, because we were in WeWork earlier. So we started going on day passes and trust me, the travel got so much to me that uh, within two weeks, I said, no, uh, we can, we can certainly make it work on zoom. So many things are going to change. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, you know what, since uh, this has become a, a, a fixed piece for us, I, I even asked Babita and Swami, and by the way, uh, Anupada, Babita and Swami, they run your green canvas. They were on our, on our show. Uh, they are green activists. Uh, and so I, I, I told them to create something for me, which becomes like my Zoom, uh, you know, uh, the Zoom place. And, and I think I've got a nice, nice one now. So, so I, I am prepared for life out of my office at home. How, what do you feel about it? Do you see in, uh, in Singapore also, are you, are you seeing people reluctant to go to office or do you see like people are waiting to throng back to offices again? It depends whether you're single or married or whether you have kids or <laughs> so there's a lot of variation. I think that uh, most of the single people are really bored and alone at home and they want to go out. Uh, in Singapore, we've been lucky that uh, we, you know, restaurants are open and life is almost normal. So it's, okay. uh, everybody has a mask on, everybody follows the rules. Uh, so we are lucky. Our, our office uh, has also been open since October. It's optional for you to go. Um, and we are seeing the crowds slowly, slowly increasing. So people are warming up to the idea of coming into the office at least to socialize. So if you look at Indian streets, by the way, you will, apart from the mask, there is no trace of a post-COVID world or other even a COVID world. Everyone yeah. is back to life uh, the way it was. Okay, we only see masks on the on the road, so nothing has changed. But yes, I don't think uh, that enthusiasm to go to office is shared by many. Like, I need to go to the office and 
most people said uh, we're very happy working from home and a uh, lot of our guys are actually not even in bombay I mean, they've gone back to their hometowns or whatever and uh, honestly we're not pressing the panic bells till we see that from the clients i don't see even clients in a hurry to get back to office which is surprising uh, but yeah i think uh, it it remains to be seen how things pan out but the world will definitely change and i think uh, we are at about 66 now which is 71, uh, 72 73 we've already shot 73 at 702 okay. maybe so we'll sh- uh, yeah i can see going by the minute by the way by the second we shot quite a lot so maybe we can start off what do you say or do you because want because today we have uh, a lot of interesting yeah. anecdotes i mean yeah 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 i think uh, the best decision was to change the format and i think uh, the informal chat which we had i think two informal chats which we had with anuprata in a way uh, for all our audiences that kind of shaped how uh, you know that's glory story will be conducted uh, over a period of time because we just discovered a brilliant new format and i think i hope you like it today uh, with all the stories and anecdotes that anuprata has in store for us Uh, so i think yeah there's no harm alok in starting we are yeah, we're seven, already eight, close to 100 now okay yeah. let's begin then so so hello wonderful people once again welcome to the second episode in season 2 of guts glory and story uh, remember in the season as uh, sangram was alluding we are not going to decode any vertical or any industry but we will only uncover stories of raw guts that define our guests and these are stories of inspiration and of reason with a lot for everyone to learn from ladies and gentlemen we bring to you men and women of strength repute and resilience who have defied logic who have defied stereotypes and this one who's sitting right in front of you and even fate and today we have anuprata bhaumik who's a true iconoclast in the positive sense and a destroyer of stereotypes i've used that word after a very long time long long time but it fits her so well but more of that very shortly uh and those of you who don't know us uh, uh god god forbid but nevertheless i am alok sinha serial ceo author and an entrepreneur and i'm joined by my illustrious co-host sangram surve who's an ad man a filmmaker and a marketing strategist i will now turn to him to introduce anuprata to all of you and bring her on air so uh, anuprata first of all very very well a, a very warm welcome to you on our show and with that sangram over to you to get her on okay i think we've already brought her on she was already a part of the part of the Hello. show from the beginning <laughs> but i'm just going to tell uh, a little anecdote as to how we got introduced uh, i was taking a author branding session in singapore and uh, i think it was a literature festival in singapore and anuprata was part of that and absolutely true to her inevitable style of uh, directly coming introducing her, herself and you'll hear many anecdotes like that uh, in today's session as well uh we got introduced that way and uh, one could instantly make out that uh, you're speaking to um an extraordinary but yet a very easy going personality and we kept in touch uh, on facebook largely um and we said we should do something together but nothing really materialized over a long time and uh, when we started god's glory story season 2 uh, one of the names on my list was anuprata and that's when actually we spoke uh, after the singapore uh, festival on phone after a long time instead of just doing hello hi's on facebook and when i heard uh, her stories back even in those little conversations i said i think we found one of our guests over here and i think the most opportune time was international women's day because uh, she has broken so many stereotypes especially when it comes to women uh, that we thought it would be apt to have her on 5th of march which is very close to the international women's day right a career has been studded with badge value brands i mean mitraland intel apple dell hp and now google uh, and jitne bade naam utni badi kahaniyan you know so we have uh, and that's more interesting actually that rather than having strategies about how these brands make i think it's more important to know 
uh, how people like her have navigated through brands and yet managed to be grounded. And what I love about Anupratha is that she's very grounded. She's very easygoing. She's not just uptight corporate kind of person. And you'll discover more of that uh, as we question. And I'm going to deep dive. So a warm welcome, Anupratha, to God's Glory Story. And I'm straight away going to deep dive on the question. But one interesting change in format, by the way, is uh, we did not make it about understanding sectors, as Alok said. And we just said, tell us interesting stories from your life. And you know, she started telling stories. And it was like an hour and a half of us listening to her stories. And a very interesting format uh, emerged from there is that each of the stories had like one little principle that could be a takeout for all of us. And we said, that's the format. We don't want uh, you know, a structure to guide the session. Rather, let stories guide the session. And that's what we've done right now. We've picked up select anecdote stories from her life. And there are some lessons that hopefully we can all take out of here. Right? And uh, going to the very first one, I think uh, going back to your college days, you know, uh, and it goes to that classical engineering college stereotype in India where there is a very classic male female divide and you know when, whenever you come to india you say boss you know spotting a woman on an engineering campus is itself like a marvel right i don't think it was different for you anuprata uh, and many women feel so much out of place oh my god i'm the only woman here you didn't see to choose i mean you didn't choose to see it that way uh, we'd like you to take you back uh, to that time because uh, what was a disadvantage for many people you saw that as an advantage and that's where I guess breaking stereotypes started, right? Let's go back to engineering days. You were about to say, let's take you back 30 years. You would be right. <laughs> so this is 30 <laughs> years ago um, that I started engineering college. Now everybody's trying to calculate my age. So that's okay. Uh, it's, it's Friday, whatever. Um, when I was in engineering, there were, you're right, there were just five girls in a class of 85 guys. And uh, I didn't think of it at that time as a disadvantage because I felt like everybody knew the five of us, right? Our names were instantly remembered by everybody from, uh, you know, the clerks in the office to our professors. And, you know, when it came to class discussion points or whatever it is, when a girl stands up to say something, everybody listens in the engineering school. So I feel like the, it was as long as you were, uh, okay with that limelight and that attention. Um, it was not necessarily a disadvantage. Uh, of course, you have, you know, uh, a lot of people saying, oh, why, why are you doing engineering? You're wasting an engineering seat, et cetera, et cetera, because you're going to go and get married and have kids and you're not going to work, et cetera. But equally, I found a lot of uh, my friends uh, who are still, you know, my closest friends from those days. Um, a lot of the, uh, the guys that studied with me actually stood up and said, oh, you just watch the five of these girls are going <laughs> to take you on. And, and that really happened. And even the five of us created like a sisterhood and we were allies for each other. There were friends of us who were allies for each other. So it was not necessarily a disadvantage. It gave us a lot of visibility and a lot of confidence. Okay. And I guess uh, immediately post that, I'm going to go to uh, that big job interview. Uh, <laughs> and I think you've never taken no for an answer. What we gather yeah. from your story. This was a very interesting. <laughs> this was a very interesting way of how I entered the tech world. So, uh, typically in India, I know that the audience today is very international, but typically in India, you throw a stone and you find an engineer, right? So you can have the luxury of hiring salespeople as engineers. And so many of uh, my seniors were uh, joining this company called Microland and it was growing 100% every year. It was uh, the startup of startups and it was bringing all these uh, multinationals like Compaq and Microsoft and Intel and uh, Cisco, you know, all the local area, wide area networking companies into India and they were the distributor. So I applied for a job in sales and uh, I went through all the interviews and then I had my final discussion with HR and they said, yeah, we are ready to give you a job, but we notice you applied for sales and that must be a mistake. You need to reconsider 
you can, we can hire you in any other function, but not in sales. And I said, why not? And the HR director said, because you're a girl. And that just <laughs> made me very angry because I was like, what, like, which century do you live in? Um, and he, he just said, look, absolutely, this is unsafe. This is India. You cannot imagine, you know, all the things that guys can do that you can't do and blah, blah, blah. So I was very upset, but I had no power, right? He said, I'm, I'm only willing to give you a job if you pick any other function. So I went back, but I was seething with anger and I called one of the people I knew who was working there as a salesperson. And I was like ranting and he said, oh, what do you want to do? I said, I wish I could do something, but I don't know what to do. And he said, well, the co-founder is going to be in town tomorrow. You want to meet him? I can set up a meeting. So I went to this meeting with uh, the co-founder of Microland. His name is Jawahar BK. And I just barged in to his room and I, he said, please sit down. Have, would you like a glass of water? I said, I do not want to sit down. I just want to tell you that this is, you know, just impossible. I don't know how can you do this and what do you think and what is, uh, so he just said, you're hired. And I went on with my monologue and, and he said like, you're hired, congratulations. He stood up and then he's like a big guy stood up and said, congratulations, you're hired. And I'm like, yeah, I, I'm hired. He said, yeah, that's exactly what I want. You are really gutsy. You just walked in, you said, you spoke your mind, you said the right thing. You know, women can do everything that a guy can do. I don't see any reason why we can't hire you in sales. And so I became the first sales woman there. And funnily enough, what I remember about that time is that uh, we used to have this award ceremony at the end of the year. And uh, one year, um, soon after I joined, I got the best salesman award. <laughs> and then I went and said, you know, like, oh, thank you with the trophy sales salesman. So they got it changed for me, <laughs> to salesperson. So that felt really special <laughs> that, that uh, you know, perhaps one of the first breaking of stereotypes in my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm assuming that Jawahar is yet a great supporter and a friend of yours. He is, he is. He just laughs and he tells many people about this incident and embarrass me, embarrasses me all the time. So, so, you know, in fact, viewers, we did ask Kanupruta, can we talk about this? Can we name the person? I mean, can we say hell broke loose when you wouldn't sit down and you were like a diatribe of <laughs> and she said, yeah, yeah, he's absolutely happy to do that. And I think he was one of your biggest supporters. And I like to go forward from there because I remember you said uh, one of the biggest principles that you uh, uh, learned very early in life was the principle of networking. And I think you said that uh, a lot of women don't know how to use it. And this uh, principle has helped you generously. And in your words, I remember you said, <clears throat> You saw the goodness and it comes back to you. Tell us more. You know, especially with starting, uh, starting with Intel, with the art of building connections and creating career sponsors. Uh, by the way, viewers, I, 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 uh, because I know of the story, I must remind you that meeting colleagues over cocktail hadn't yet come of age, especially for women at that point in time. Uh, and, and, this, this is a very interesting story, how, how Anipratha actually spun it around. And, and also please add about the Apple opportunity. How did it spawn from this? So over to you, Anipratha. Sure. Um, so this is very interesting. I had, you know, I was in Singapore. I didn't know many people. Um, I am a very morning person. So I wake up really early. And the only thing I knew was like, oh, take the train, go to the office. So I used to go to the office super early um, along with the cleaners. And then the only other person who was there was uh, our sales director, who was also a morning person. And uh, he lived by Orchard Road, just like a walking distance from the office. So he used to be there and I used to be there. And uh, I wanted to talk to him, but I didn't know what I should say. And Starbucks had just opened in Singapore and uh, it was in our building. I was like, let me ask him because sometimes see him with the Starbucks coffee in his hand when he comes up. 
And uh, of course, uh, you know, it was very prestigious to have a Starbucks coffee in your hand. So one day I just walked up to him and I said, um, I think we should meet, uh, we should have a chat. Coffee is on me. And he just looked at me like I was this, this very like, who are you? <laughs> he was so much above me in the hierarchy. And I, I was just like, coffee is on me. So he said, oh, uh, I can buy my own coffee. Thank you. But if you would like to have coffee, let's, you know, have coffee. And so from then onwards, we actually started going to Starbucks and, you know, having a coffee chat almost on a daily basis. And to this day, I keep doing that, right? I pick on people and ask like, do you want to have a coffee? Um, because I think it's very nice. You don't have to restrict yourself to, you know, al I used to not drink any alcohol at that time. So like, I'm not going to go join the guys on Friday for TGIF. Uh, but I thought that you don't have to restrict yourself. You can just walk up to anybody and ask them like, will you have brunch or coffee or lunch or whatever it is. And uh, I think Keith Farazi has written that book, which I like very much, which is never eat lunch alone or something like that. Never eat alone, sorry. And um, I think that's absolutely true. Um, in fact, you know, I was thinking through my entire career as I was uh, thinking about all the anecdotes in my life. I have never actually applied for a single job. <laughs> I have always found connections who tapped me on the shoulder and said, I think you should speak to that person. And that's what happened with this Intel director because when I was pregnant with my first child whilst I was at Intel and I wanted to come back to Bombay and have my baby with, you know, like my family, my parents were here and stuff like that. And I wasn't getting a transfer role from Intel Singapore to India. Uh, and then I was like, oh, should I leave? I don't know what to do. And he said, oh, I'll just talk to, uh, I'll just talk to somebody at Apple. They need somebody to start the Mumbai office. Would you do it? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> yes, I would. So I, uh, so that's how I got the Apple opportunity. Okay, brilliant. And uh, at that point in time, I mean, uh, we, we've come to the story at the right point in time. And you also mentioned the fact that you were pregnant uh, and starting the Apple office in India is like a big job, right? And <laughs> yes. that's not the stereotype, right? I mean, A, uh, when you're pregnant, typically you should be taking the time off. And that's a time when a job that's apparently will demand so much on you is come and fall into your lap. How did you manage that... Uh, work-life balance, you have two children and you're a great mother because uh, I think we're friends on Facebook. Her Facebook posts are only about uh, her kids. Uh, so I know that she's a great homemaker, but at the same time, you've had a badge value career. So how do you break that stereotype of, uh, you know, that great careers and being a great homemaker do not go together? I think uh, your support system needs to be in place, both at work as well as at home. Um, I, I think women are really good at this, right? At balance and at multitasking and um, having a to-do list running in their head at all times. I do think that women take an incredible amount of mental load and sweat the small stuff, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I, I have been very fortunate that I've had mentors and I've had leaders who have told me that um, you can't, you can't quit or you can't leave. You can't take time off or whatever it is. Um, I remember that I was pregnant and, you know, I was like uh, thinking that I will not be able to open an office in India, knowing how hard it is to do anything in India. And we are talking many years ago when uh, there was a lot of red tape and bureau bureaucracy and corruption and all of that stuff. Um, but I was, I was thinking that they'll probably have a long interview process and I'll, you know, be able to deliver and then go back to uh, work. Uh, but I was six months pregnant and, and maybe because I was just 25 years old, I was not showing or whatever it is. And we didn't have video conferencing. Um, so I, I just felt I should inform them. You've offered me the job, but I 
am six months pregnant and I can't really start a job now. I'll have to finish uh, X, Y, Z and come back. And my hiring manager told me, isn't this the perfect opportunity then? Because, you know, initial days, you'll be working out of home and you find something. And I said, yeah, but I'm pregnant. And he said, oh, most women in this world are pregnant at some point in the time. Their life doesn't stop because of that. So just go do it. And I said, but I can, like, there's one more week. And after that, I can't fly. And he said, okay, good. Then fly tomorrow. Go. <laughs> and and <laughs> I was like, all right. So I think, uh, you know, people have come through for me. And many, um, I've, I have many mentors who have believed in me way more than I believed in myself at these uh, opportune moments. So I'm very grateful for having that kind of a support network. My family has been incredibly supportive. Um, you know, not, my, my daughter has been an extremely easy kid. Um, I can't say the same about my son, but, <laughs> but it, is, uh, it, it is also credit to my husband who has always looked at my career and his career as equal. Um, so, yeah. So out of syllabus question, before we go there, and this is purely coming out of uh, curiosity, uh, not many are able to have that confidence that uh, uh, you inspire in people. Not many are able to inspire that faith saying, I think you can do that, right? What do you think is the secret sauce for that? Um, I keep a very calm exterior. <laughs> <laughs> so whatever is going on inside my head, uh, you can't see it. So most people think that I'm very cool and collected and very Zen. I've been called very Zen. And I'm like, God alone knows why, <laughs> why they call me Zen. But, uh, but I think it's a good quality because I can keep a smile on my face, even though there's a lot of, I'm, I'm fraught with anxiety. Uh, I also think through a lot of details. Um, and again, I give the impression that, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not thinking through all those details. I'm very impulsive. Um, so it's, it's just, I think, uh, I think that uh, there is a trait where people feel like the attitude is everything. And I use that too, right? When I interview people, when I look at people, I just feel like that can-do attitude is a very special thing. And I wish more people would just embrace it and say, okay, here's an opportunity. I'll grab it with both hands. I'll figure out how to do the rest later. It will happen. Don't worry, right? There will be... It, things will fall in place, but you have to say yes to the opportunity first. Absolutely. So, so Sangram, just a tidbit. Like us, she's a fire sign, but her fire is not here. Her fire is here. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he's, she's telling us. But great. And I know you did the same with HP when you had a similar circumstance uh, when you were moving at people. Yeah, I was looking at that time for a people management opportunity. And, you know, my boss at that time said, oh, all other things being equal, do an MBA. So I went and did an MBA. And my daughter was two years old, but I had a full-time job and I was looking after her. Um, I mean, she was in daycare and I would pick her up. And then I went and did an MBA, night school. So I would pick her up from the daycare and I would hand her over to my husband who would then take her home. And then I would go attend classes. And again, people thought like, are you mad? Like, what's wrong with you? Why are you doing this at this time? I want to become a people manager. So I finished the MBA, but you know, it was the most unfortunate time to do the MBA because as soon as I started, the 9-11 happened. There were no jobs. Um, people were cutting. And then just before I graduated, then SARS happened in Singapore. And then there were no jobs at all. So, so my boss was like, I know I told you that you have to do an MBA to get a people management opportunity, but now it's not there. Uh, however, if you are ready to move countries, right? Like HP was setting up uh, its, in, its captive BPO in Bangalore and said, like, it's your country. If you are ready to go back, then you can get a big people management opportunity. And uh, I was like, how big? 
is it 300 people? You want to manage them? So my literally my first people management opportunity was to manage 300 people. <laughs> and I was hoping that they don't know that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, I just went there. This, like it would have taken me years and years and years to get such a large team in Singapore. Um, and uh, I, I, I had to go. My husband was doing very well in his career here. And we had a four-year-old. I thought, well, why not introduce her to India? And I just took her uh, with me. And, uh, you know, a funny thing that happened at that time is we used to have um, Yahoo at that time. We used to have a video on Yahoo, very on dial-up internet and like very archaic. But uh, my daughter asked me, are we getting divorced? Uh, I'm like, who? Are we divorcing daddy? So I, I even learned how to look at things from her perspective that you know, I had not taken the trouble to explain that to her. So the lesson learned for me was take people along. Please explain to your team what you're trying to do. So, you know, like have them weigh in on the decision. Don't just pick up and go because like, I see that opportunity. I have to go after it. Agreed. Uh, not necessarily be Clint Eastwood in every situation. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, this part this is a question and, and i'm going to jump into it is the most interesting one when we were discussing with you and and it's not uh it's not every day when you meet uh very illustrious big big names you have yes. uh and uh i alluded it even in my in my video uh, but you had a very simple attitude towards them. You know, after all, they are all human beings, right? I think you 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 did something similar to someone else. So, uh, tell us a little bit more about these men. You know, especially start with Bill Gates and go over to Steve Jobs. Not many have met both <laughs> and directly uh, dealt with them. Uh, Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so it was uh, when I was still at Microland. Um, I told you Microland was a distributor for Microsoft as well. And it was Bill Gates' first visit to India. And uh, there was a big event which Microland had organized. And we had invited the who's who of uh, the Indian industry. And people had all flown down to Bombay and, um, you know, all the A-listers think about Tata, Birla, Ambani, that all of them were there uh, in the front row. And I was looking out from backstage and, you know, I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Like this, so all these people over there. I was very intimidated. I was very nervous. And I saw Bill Gates sitting there waiting for his cue. And I was supposed to be the announcer and compare and all. So I said, okay, only he and I are sitting <laughs> I just went up to him and in my nervousness, I said, don't be nervous. After all, we are just human beings. And oh. that was more for my own benefit, but he just broke out into laughter. And he was like, what's your name? And I said, I am Anupreeta and I'm going to announce this and I'm going to introduce you now. And we had a little chat before the event began and uh, as part of his speech, he actually called me out. Like he actually said that, oh, I was very nervous backstage because it's my first trip to India and I'm meeting all of you. Uh, but, you know, uh, Anupreeta, who just introduced me, reminded me that we're all human, like, including me. <laughs> so, so it's like suddenly, uh, uh, yeah, my name was known to all of those people and everybody had a good laugh, of course, including, including me. Now, when I think about it, it's like cringe-worthy thing that I, I did. Just told you him should, send a, note. You no, should send a note to him. Remember, I soothed your yeah. nerves, Mr. I'm, Gates. <laughs> I was the one who made you laugh. Uh, because uh, apparently he doesn't laugh very much or he's very nervous for public speaking. Or he used to be. I'm sure he's not anymore. Um, the other incident was quite a stark contrast because... Um, I was in Apple at that time and I wanted to convince uh, Cupertino head office to um, divert some supply to India. And at that time, you know, they used to think that, oh, whatever the world cannot consume, the leftover supplies should go to India, the older products should go to India. And they had just launched these colorful iMacs and iBooks. And I was like, no, no, we need to have all those colorful iMacs, like neon blue and orange and pink and whatnot. 
and i came up with like very well thought through facts and figures about you know target market etc cetera, etc cetera. and then um i put up that proposal that this is how many units we can sell in india and nobody believed in them because most people think india is a very poor country but what they don't realize is that india whatever is true in india the exact opposite is also true india also has very very rich people who would love to buy a mac even at that time this is we are talking 99 right so i uh, had this my my boss said oh you're so bullish do you want to ask the ceo directly for his approval i said yeah okay why not and then people were like uh, okay fine and i think they were really sending a lamb to slaughter because they were thinking let's have a good laugh at, about this and i went and i you know i i did my presentations in dead earnest i prepared etc and i went and presented my business case and steve jobs said only four words badge on the table and he asked it like a question and i thought he's agreed to whatever i have presented and it's his way of saying cheers or shake hands maybe he doesn't want to shake hands with me uh so i removed my badge and put it on the table and he looked like approved and walked out and that's it and i looked at my okay. boss and and i was like let's pop the champagne he approved it and they're like do you know what you just did if you don't sell these many units your job is on the line you said badge on the table you're ready to give up your badge if you don't sell this and i'm like oh okay but now it's done so i guess <laughs> i have to sell it now let's figure out you know let's look forward because yeah the deed is already done but i had no clue i don't know what kind of whether it's an americanism or whatever it is with my limited knowledge at that time i had no clue what badge on the table meant but um luckily my calculations were correct and i did manage to sell all those units in india and uh, i got an email back from him it was one word nice <laughs> so man of very few words five words <laughs> five words with him like golden words like my five minutes of fame it's like my five words from steve right so i guess the whole journey of uh, bumping into illustrious men doesn't stop at steve jobs uh i i believe uh, you also had a brush with mr bond james bond yeah <laughs> another job just because, just because she loved uh, or liked uh, pierce brosnan right is, is that what it is anupratha um yes i was the i was the product manager for the world's first pocket pc which was the hp jornada 540 series and i was launching this product and you're thinking how do we launch it in a big way and amongst other things we were working with our marketing agency uh and say so we what amongst other things we could do product placement in a movie so which movie so my favorite actor at that time was pierce brosnan so i was like we have to do it now that pierce brosnan is bond i think two bond movies had released with pierce brosnan and i was like can we do it with the bond movie and then we put that business case up and uh, you know we got rejected because bond movie does not stand with hp standards of business conduct because in you know, the depiction of women particularly is is very bad in bond movies so um so we got to know and then uh, i also thought that yeah whatever is coming from the office of the ceo is correct and besides the ceo we had like very senior women role models for me so we had ann livermore we had Car carly fiorina who had just become the ceo of hp etc so i was like i agree actually the depiction of women in bond movies needs to change and i asked the marketing agency can we arrange for a meeting and uh, they are like what now you're going to change the plot of the bond movie or what i said like we can try so all that we requested was can we just instead of at the end when bond jumps in and saves the lives of everybody including the woman can the woman use the jonada 540 series and detonate the bomb or whatever it is that happens and so oh. they said okay but for that then the woman will have to be a scientist or whatever i'm like even better 
so <laughs> we have <coughs> this movie called the world is not enough and um denise richards played dr christmas jones and she was a rocket scientist and she that she saved and bond was like handcuffed in a submarine and uh she actually saved the day and that changed how bond movies looked at women so i feel very grateful that you know we were a team of course i didn't do this alone we had the marketing agency we had so many people support but i think like it was a room full of women um in and that that day we felt as if we had done something for all women kind you know so it it was just an amazing amazing part of my journey which i feel uh that i only suggested a bond movie because i wanted a photograph with pierce brosnan which i got okay. but, <laughs> but unknowingly we changed something forever so that's, and that's no, no anecdotes from mr brosnan no anecdotes i asked for a picture he said okay i always always take pictures with pretty women so sure <laughs> <laughs> okay great and i think uh, the the other interesting one is uh, when uh, your entire maxim of never be bound by your job description right yes and uh, you were in hp and uh, you've been managing people you've done sales and for the first time you had a chance to jump into product design and yes. uh, it it all happened because you did not let your job description define what you should be doing right yes and, uh there's a whole anecdote about 13 inch monitors i i think oh, we should tell dell. you yeah it's a dell actually um okay. but um yeah so i spent 10 years of my career at dell and um i did products development and worked closely with engineering and uh, one of the things i noticed is that nobody talks to every like nobody takes inputs from every part and one of the things i thought was essential rather than just looking at the speeds and feeds talking to the road maps of your supplier innovation you should also talk to what i what is the voice of your customers and you know the people who know the voice of the customer the customer support engineers so i went and asked customer support engineers and got lists of things that people used to call us up with and uh, i could connect the dots and say okay well in our next road map we have to correct these features and these features because this these are the top issues that our customers are facing one of the largest accounts which we wanted to win was google because uh, this, they had standardized on these apple 30 inch monitors and i had uh, actually moved from the product team into pricing so it was a large bid going on and i was leading global pricing for dell at that time and uh, i wouldn't stop interfering with the product guys i think i must have cheesed off a lot of people in my quest of limitless boundaryless uh, thinking so i went and said like okay here's what i'm going to do i'm going to talk to all the users in google about what is it about apple's 13 inch monitors that you really enjoy and love and what is it that you can't see us doing in dell's 30 inch monitors and then they gave me a list of things and they showed me you know what was happening etc so i made a lot of friends at google at that time um and uh, we won as a result of all that customer data that we collected we actually managed to incorporate that uh, into the products and we got the pricing right because you know obviously you talk to people you connect and i had i already had that sales mentality that we have to win this deal so we have to find out what would be the right pricing etc and we won that deal and that was a huge coup for us at that time that google said all over the world we are going to replace apple 30 inch monitors with um dell 30 inch monitors and apple actually went um they went eol like they exited that line which was even bigger right uh and for for somebody like dell who was not known to be first mover or not known to be an innovation company they were known to be more of a get the price right kind of a company and uh it was very moving for them but what it did for me little did i realize that it sowed the seeds for me for my current job 10 years later who knew 
that I would be leading customer experience at uh, Google in hardware. So imagine that, right? And um, sometimes you, know, you, you don't know what good is up. That's why I say that when you sow goodness wherever you go and somewhere, somehow it's going to benefit you. <laughs> it's going to come back, karma. Out of syllabus question. So did, syllabus. Jobs, did Jobs write another note to you or your ex-boss write anything from Apple or it was like radio silence? I don't think he knew who was behind this. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, again, I can't take credit for this. Obviously, I was just one part of like a very large team which worked on that deal. And uh, it's just nice to be able to instigate people to think out of their boxes and silos and, you know, build bridges and connections and help people to collaborate because you do need to, um, you know, you, you need an army, right, for everything. Uh, as they say, you need a village to raise a child. So similarly, I feel like, all cross-functional teams, hardware is a very complex business, all cross-functional teams, supply chain, logistics, um, you know, product, everybody is important in that. It's not only about selling it. It's not only about marketing it. I think we can move on slowly to uh, the audience questions because I think we've got 15. So uh, audience, if you have any questions, you can type them in Q&A, but we've already got a lot of questions from the audience when they filled out uh, the registration forms. And I think one is very peculiar because uh, I would say if you're inspiring women who are entering in their careers now in 2020, uh, you, you know, your journey and how you began your career was obviously, as you said, uh, many, almost three decades back. So yeah. A, what would you advise an Anuprita today if she's entering her career? Would some of those same rules apply or do you think the world has changed? What would be your advice to the you, but in today's time? Um, I think patience would be <laughs> my, my advice. My advice to myself now also is that I, I get very impatient. I get very wound up about results and results fast. Um, so in that, I, I think there's a lot of, a lot of times I felt that if I had been more thoughtful about this, right, I had been more patient, those good things were going to happen anyway. I didn't have to force it. And so sometimes I have to remind myself to like step back and think through the implications and think about like, you know, if it doesn't happen, so what? Like, why does it, why does it have to be this way? Why can't it be this other way? Right. And you don't see the other perspective. You don't see the other ways. If you are laser focused on getting what you want and getting it fast. So you may miss out on a better opportunity because you were so obsessed or you were, you were just looking at what, you know, Arjuna's fish eye, uh, you may miss everything else in the background. So. Yeah. Someone said, if you're on a roller coaster, don't close your eyes. Yeah. Because it's scary, but you miss everything. That's right. <laughs> you miss the yeah. fun. Yeah. There's another interesting one. And, and uh, this is a tongue-in-cheek, I think. But it's an interesting one. Forum Meta. Do you see men as allies, frenemies, or immaterial to your progress? Or in general, women empowerment today? I mean, are men allies, frenemies, or immaterial? Doesn't matter. Forum is definitely my friend and ally. <laughs> so Forum works for PayPal in Singapore. And he was also my, um, he's an alum of Stanford LEAD program, which I have completed as well. So we are both uh, in the alum group. Uh, so thanks Forum for the question. I do want to say that uh, most of my opportunity and most of my bosses have been men because there have been a lot of, uh, there have been a lot of women as well who have been mentors and role models for me um, and definitely hired me as well. There, but I think there are more men. Unfortunately, the leadership representation of women is very small. So obviously I've had a lot of bosses who believed in me, um, I've had, fantastic colleagues and peers who have believed in me. I have sometimes stepped on their toes by telling them what to do in their function. 
and then they have you know kind of like gently nudged me away like go do your own work uh, so i've received a lot of help and guidance and support i mean um, i couldn't have balanced everything without um, you know kushal my husband and uh, my brother has been like an awesome uh, support and guidance uh, and and given me like he's younger than me but he's often given me that patience speech uh, because he is incredibly patient and um, i have yeah i would i would think that men have been allies in my life i have been in i have had incredible men in my team and um, you know i've followed their careers over time as well so so yeah i think we we can all be helpful to each other and we can all be allies because all of us have some privilege right so we can all be allies in some way uh, to help others who don't have this that same privilege that you have very profound very well said and I think we have someone from uh, the audience is a live question. I think it comes from Kunal Arora. Okay. And he says uh, you've mentioned about the can do attitude. Yes. Now would you hire a, a candidate if he or she doesn't exactly have some part of the important skills uh, that are required for the particular job but he expresses great passion, sincerity and is willing to learn and succeed in that role? Um yeah, absolutely. And I have done that the probably several people who have been in my team and uh, they've either benefited from this so they've been witness to me doing exactly that i'm a huge believer in diversity and diversity of thought and diversity of experience not just you know diversity of your skin color or uh, your physical characteristics but actual you know where did you study how did you grow up what what was your training so i have done things which uh would be seemingly like like why did you hire an engineer a uh, customer support engineer into pricing i've done that because i thought it was important to bring that analytical methodical thinking into uh, operational thinking into pricing uh similarly you know in my product management days i've hired people from sales because i was a sales person who was successful at product management so why not um and yeah i i i do hire for the can do attitude i like people who never take no for an answer uh and i i i have some incredible stories to tell you talk about breaking stereotypes just currently um there's a, there's a woman that is inspiring to me she uh did a phd she did her phd whilst she was a googler a manager and she has two kids so she got her phd and then she uprooted herself from china and she moved to singapore with her two children alone for their education and for their life experience and um, despite being like 14 years at google and being a successful people manager she chose to come to my team for a six month assignment as an individual contributor so you know there there are all kinds of people who just want a chance she had a very success she has a very successful sales career sales management career but she wants to be in customer experience I, why am i going to say no to that so uh critical difference is uh, i mean rather a question further question is what's the difference between misplaced confidence and can do attitude because even that can happen right a person yeah. has a lot of attitude you take a punt on that how do you what is your way to make out a fine nuance between what is misplaced confidence and can do yeah i think that you've got to take risks or you have to you know take some bets you have to and it's not all these experiments that i do not all of these experiments are successful obviously i'm talking about the successes uh so i have made mistakes in my life i've made mistakes of taking on a job which was really hard for me to do or i was not a good fit um and then what you do is you unravel the mistake right you just step back and say this is not the right thing i i probably jumped into it with misplaced confidence or overconfidence uh but there is nothing you know 
there is there is no finality to this because a job is just a job just like i was saying bill gates was just a human uh, or steve jobs is just a human was just a human being uh, a job is just a job if it's not this job then there's some other job right so you don't have to get unnecessarily wrapped around that failure um but if you don't try you'll never know Mm-hmm. and try not to repeat the same mistake twice try not to repeat the same mistake that too i think so so there's a good saying that uh, i think it was jobs if you're not if you're not failing to to too many times you're not trying yes yeah. absolutely and i learned that in my sales career right because you have to overcome that fear of rejection in sales you lose more deals than you win obviously otherwise you're not trying hard enough Yeah. There is a question in the chat I think. Yeah, yeah, that's a very interesting one actually and that's uh, for you on networking. Yes. And uh, she said talking of networking uh, it comes from Mick George and says uh, talking about networking how do we network with senior management uh, as a mid level manager so you are a mid level manager how do you network with senior management what can i possibly ask the ceo of an mnc when i meet him at events? I think you should yeah, ask this question, right? Ah, oh, good question. <laughs> this is a good question. Just start them, about. Tell them, don't be nervous. You're only human, so am I. Uh, but yeah, jokes aside, I think uh, Miggy has asked a very interesting question. I have never felt out of ideas of asking questions because you know people love to talk about themselves. They love it so. if you just walk up to somebody and say well i really admire your work or you walk up to an author and i and say i read your book and i think chapter number this this was awesome then they'll start the dialogue so you can walk up to any i walked up to sangram he was like on stage he had just done a mega launch uh, etc and uh, i just walked up to him and i said Uh, oh survey are you maharashtrian and i i knew the answer to that question but i went and asked him that <laughs> you know because it is just an icebreaker and i'm like i i'm anupriya bomik but you know that's my married name i am actually maharashtrian and it was as easy as that right like just ask there is no wrong answer no no wrong question right there's as as they say like there's no stupid question there's no such thing as a stupid question you can just how you carry it right it's how you carry the way it. you carry it yeah you can you can ask them anything that you know you've read so one of the things that you do have to do is that you have to read right you have to read about the ceo of you know the company i mean if there is something in the news happening right now there's something in the news happening uh, in australia for example you want to be able to ask the right relevant questions to show that you are coming from a place of um of curiosity but it's well placed curiosity it's not like you know are you married or how many children do you have or things like that which perhaps is not an appropriate question to ask in a business setting uh but then again if you are at a a uh, social setting and you're meeting somebody for the first time and you ask that question it's a perfectly legit question to ask absolutely and, and from there this this additional question so the, uh, this is kalpita kunde she is asked have you ever coped with hi kalpita with... kalpita is from my school okay so <laughs> there's a question from your friend then have you have you coped with racism and prejudice as a driven woman of color working in a white dominated industry um so it is true that i've worked for um only large american multinational corporations and uh, i think that there is always there is always a certain stereotype which will be associated so um if i speak good english then people come and ask me how do you speak such good english i'm like i went to an english medium school in india <laughs> so that's how i speak good exactly. english and then they'll be like oh you're so confident did you did you study in the states did you spend some time in the states so i'll be like no i was just born this way i was like no there is nothing there is nothing to say that it's it's just lack of knowledge 
I take it as a lack of knowledge and I take it upon myself to educate people who come from a positive intent. They are asking you questions from a lack of knowledge. Now, the other part is where you're being denied a job or something because of uh, uh, prejudice against you. So I don't know if I have been ever denied. Like, I feel like I've been incredibly lucky and I've got you know, fantastic opportunities, most of which I have not gone and applied for. People have asked me, would you like to do this? Would you like to do that? So I haven't faced that kind of a prejudice um, from, a, from an opportunity perspective. And if I have, then I don't know. What I don't know doesn't hurt me at this moment. I always try to have diverse candidate pools. When I'm doing an interview, I'm very demanding that the candidate pool is, is very diverse. And the interview pool is also, the interviewer pool is also very diverse uh, to just get rid of those sort of prejudices. So I think- uh, we can slip in one question. Yeah, yeah, so I, I think one, uh, we have one from Amit and then I think I have one more observation stroke question because I think, and I'm gonna put that first and then I'm gonna take Amit's question last. And, I think one thing that strikes me apart is your career looks like a smooth ride, right? And you also mentioned that I've been incredibly lucky. As a matter of fact, there is a question on luck. And uh, I'm reminded of Dale Carnegie's definition of luck. And it says luck is a meeting point of alertness and opportunity. So I personally believe that if you are positive in your head and if your head is always alert, you attract opportunities, right? And uh, the universe conspires. The universe, I mean, all of these proverbs make sense to me. Fortune favors the brave. Okay. If you are positive minded, you're like an opportunity magnet. And that's what I think comes across. And a lot of people are saying, oh my God, how is it only right things happen to her? Well, you said the right wives and the right things will happen to you. Would you agree with that? Uh, so I, first of all, I do believe in being at the right place at the right time. And uh, there are times when I have not been that someone who is in the right place at the right time and somebody else has been there. And I've looked at them and I've said, oh, why did I not get that? Um, but later on, I've realized that, that probably I didn't get that opportunity because something else was waiting for me in the wings, which I didn't know. Maybe it heightened my alertness saying that, oh my God, like there are these kind of opportunities, why am I not getting them? So I, I do believe that um, luck plays a role, that there is a factor called, like you can try very, very hard. You can have everything aligned and then suddenly something disastrous can happen. So, um, so you know, I was, I was struck by lightning a few times uh, and some disastrous things happen. It's a Friday night and I don't want to dampen the mood that we've built over here. But, uh, but yes, definitely I've experienced failures and I've experienced, um, you know, those kind of unfortunate bad timing issues, etc. cetera. Um, so I do believe that luck plays a role because again, we are all human. So we, we should all be able to become CEOs, but luck, favors some and it doesn't favor others. Okay, okay. So Gabi, you said you had one more Do question. We have, uh, I think we have, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think, uh, which is asked by Money Harold and he says, it all looks like a smooth ride. So have you ever handled rejections in your life and how have you handled that? Do you have any rejections at all in the first place? Wow. Uh, thank you, Vani, for the question. Um, Vani, uh, I have had a ton of uh, rejections. As I said, you know, in sales, the, your sales is full of rejections. Um, that there, there are times when things don't go your way. And I think one of the things you have to develop is a thick skin. And you have to learn not to take things personally. So you have to just be able to tell yourself that it's just a job. You're gonna recover from it, right? It's just one mistake, it's fine. Luckily, I studied to be an engineer and not a doctor, so I don't save lives. So I can afford to make mistakes, it's okay. Uh, so sometimes you have to, uh, yeah, sometimes you, you know, place your trust on somebody and then 
a rejection happens. Sometimes you things go wrong just because of things like COVID, right? Um, I that people could not have predicted a pandemic like this would have affected all of us. But uh, but definitely, I take rejections with a pinch of salt, and I feel very bad in the moment, of course, and I wallow in. Uh, you know, self doubt and grief, but then I come out of it. <laughs> the next day, I feel like okay, I've I've had my moment. Uh, tomorrow is a new day, and uh, as I said, wake up in the morning, do your sun salutations, and uh, yeah, it's a brand new day. Beautiful. So <clears throat> I think we we will uh, bring this to a close at this time because we've just run out of time. And viewers, this was the last question. But but thank you, Anuprata. <clears throat> what a cracker of a session. What a cracker of a session. And I, I do, although it's timed with Women's Day, I think it was, it is, and it was meant for everyone. What, what an elevating session. What an elevating session. So thank you very much. Uh, all of us enjoyed uh, enjoyed this. Uh, I, I'm sure even the viewers enjoyed uh, what you spoke about. And, and to the viewers, thank you very much for giving this hour on uh, Friday evening. Uh, 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 by the way, uh, Sangram, we have Rose uh, Joshi also uh, joining us. Uh, uh, Anuprita, we uh, featured two stories of women power other than you. Uh, uh, so they, they went into our COVID tale stories. Uh, one was Rose Joshi. Uh, uh, she, she she's a singer, newfound passion, and she's got uh, audiences all over the world in a very short time. And the other one was Poonam Grover, who's who's uh, who's a baker, and in, again in a very short time she's become very well 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 uh, you know considered. So so thank you, uh, Rose, for joining us, and and uh, Anuprata, thank you once again. I, I'm sure. Yeah, thank uh, you. Thank you to all the all the viewers. I know that some viewers are tuning in from Japan, and it's like really late, almost midnight over there. Australia so, too, by the and, way, and I'm Australia. Sorry. It's middle of the night, so I am uh, very touched and very grateful for all the love. Um, but I think you know, all the love be, right back at you. The promise. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I think Anuprata has made a promise that uh, she's going to kickstart her writing with God's glory story. And she's promised us a blog on all the learnings from today's session. Uh, so yeah, I think Anuprata, you have to thank me for, for, for finally pushing you into writing and we're waiting for that book, uh, <laughs> which you promised, I think, almost four years back and we met first. Thank you, Sangram. So we was, uh, you can watch <laughs> Now you've made a public yeah. announcement. Okay. Now I have to live up to it. You have to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now the boats are, the bridges are burning. So I think you'll have to get out the blog and start writing. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I, I think we finally made it and finally did something together. Uh, and with that, I think it's a final bye-bye from all of us. Next week is uh, a very, very, very exciting session. Uh, it's, uh, it's my old friend who kind of uh, got me kickstarted into marketing books. So I do a lot of things, but marketing books was one of my passions. And the very first book that I marketed was for this guy. And you all know him by the name of Amish Tripathi. Uh, India's, uh, I would say, arguably the best-selling author, maybe just after Chetan Bhagat. But yeah, Amish is there next Saturday on 12th. And uh, so many stories I have with him. And you'll have one more session, again, of stories, of anecdotes from the master storyteller, the biggest storyteller of the country. Uh, and uh, not a session to be missed for sure. Right? 7 o'clock next Friday, one more session of stories, anecdotes from the life of Amish Tripathi. With that, a final goodbye from all of us. Thank you very much for sparing your Friday evening. Now we can go and have your drinks and enjoy the weekend. And thank you and a final goodbye from us. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Thanks again, Anupata. <laughs>